Welcome to another inspiring and timely message from our pastors here at the Crossroads. What is the greatest gift you can give? We are moving into the season of giving. And even tomorrow as we are giving thanks, it begins this season of giving. Tomorrow night, I turn on the lights the power, we need to call the power company to make sure there's more power on the grid tomorrow because I've got so many lights in my trees. It's just like it took three days to put all the lights in on the trees in the front of my house. <laughs> the gardener and I got kind of carried away this year. <laughs> but it looked, it looked good last year, but we just, the trees have grown, so we just wanted to keep adding more lights, so that we got carried away. So there's enough lights to, <laughs> to light, see from outer space or something, but it's all good. But this is a season of giving. And even, even with my neighbors, I wanted to give. I wanted to show the light. I wanted to display something of beauty. And I believe that the Lord wants to do that through our hearts. That's obviously a very external thing. But God wants to do something from our innermost being. And I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to focus on, on and asking that question, what is the greatest gift that you can give? Uh, I'll give you the answer in a few minutes. But you can begin to think about it now. All the different gifts that you could give. But what is the greatest gift that you can give? Proverbs 17.22 tells us, A cheerful heart is a good medicine. And we, we're, there's a lot of cheerfulness here tonight. I can sense it. I can feel it as we're entering into this season of giving. And there's going to be a cheerfulness and even though sometimes you're tired in your body and your mind and trying to balance everything out and be everything for everybody and do all these different things and uh, making these lists and checking it twice, and et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, it gets challenging. The more complex life becomes with time. But a cheerful heart is a good medicine. So if you want to move through this season with authority, then make a determination that I am going to have a cheerful heart. I am not going to allow myself to be robbed because the enemy wants to make you sour. He wants to make you sad. He wants to, I'll have a blue, blue Christmas kind of a, uh, you know. I mean, that's, when Elvis sang that, you know, I'll have a blue you know, it, it, it sets a tone in us. And even, you know, like today, you listen to Adele. <sighs> it's all just so sad. It is so depressing. All oh, the ways that you've been messed with. <laughs> it's all about losing. What's up with that? And yet that's what we oh, go wild over and play over again and again and again and again and again wherever you go in every elevator and every radio and all of this stuff that it says I'm going to lose. He is going to break my heart. He's a jerk. He's no good. Yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera, all of that stuff. And we, we, we buy into that as being somehow, oh, oh, you know, that ties me into a romantic kind of, if, if that's romance, we don't want it, right? <laughs> I don't want that. That's, that's, this is so far from the truth. God wants to give us a cheerful heart. So remember that. A cheerful heart is a good medicine. And then Proverbs 15 15 it says, a cheerful heart has a continual feast. You know, we can only handle so much feasting in the natural. You know, I, I, I was so determined, hallelujah, to be good the last couple of weeks. I don't know if I've really achieved it. <laughs> Especially it was y'all's fault last night, that potluck. 
But in Jesus, when the cheerfulness that God desires to bring into us and through us brings us into a continual feast, that seems to go against all of our logic, but that's where God wants to place us. So that whether we abound with much or little, depending on the temporary circumstances of our life, that it really won't affect us nearly as much. I'm not saying you don't react to being slapped in the face, or you don't react to being fired, or you don't react to being rejected, or et cetera, et cetera. But when there's that kind of feasting going on, when you recognize and realize how bountiful, how gracious, how awesomely full is his love, then it's like, well, whatever. <laughs> you know, when it comes to the temporary stuff and this temporary setbacks, we are able to put it in the right perspective. Again, not that we're going to be not react to things that hurt us, but we're able to do and move forward in a whole different light for those that believe. That is why we are called a peculiar people. And it's not like we're, woo I am happy. <laughs> no. We're very connected to reality. But we see reality from a much wider perspective. And that helps us. It helps me. And I believe it will help you. So a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Verse 16 of Proverbs 15. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with turmoil with it. And verse 17. Better is a dish of vegetables eat your vegetables, where love is, than a fattened ox served with hatred. Some of the most miserable people I've ever met, and I'm not against money or blessings or opportunities or favor, but some of the most miserable people I have ever met were people who had everything going for them and yet couldn't really enjoy it because of hatred, because of envy, because of strife. Saying, no, this is mine. Instead of holding on to things very lightly, loosely, and saying, I'm just a steward of the riches of this earth right now. And that's why I have to take good care of whatever God places in my hand but it does not bring me happiness. Amen? It does not. So it's better as a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. God wants to bring a cheerfulness to us, but to be cheerful in heart and have a giving attitude, here's the key. Buckle your seatbelt. We're in for the duration here. We're going to go the whole distance. God didn't speak this. I, I believe by faith God spoke this to me as I was driving to church. I had not planned on saying this, so it has nothing to do with any one of you in particular. But it's for all of us. But he spoke something so specific as I was driving down McPherson, turning there by the HEB and coming on up this way, all of a sudden he spoke into my heart and he said, what is the greatest gift that you can give this season? And the answer that came out of my spirit, man, because Jesus and I are 
We are one. We are one in the bond of love. But the answer that I felt like the Holy Spirit was just bubbling up in me. And it's not a, it's not a self-righteous kind of thing that well, I'm going to display how much better I am than some other person is because this is something that we all need. I need it as much or more than anyone and I'm not trying to be humble. I'm just saying it like it is. <laughs> but the greatest give, gift that I can give, and the greatest gift that you can give during this special season of time that we are moving into, starting tonight, is the gift of forgiveness. The gift of freeing others from condemnation, letting it go. It, like, it was like, uh, it was like that as I was driving. I didn't want to get distracted from driving, but it was like, whoa. The greatest gift that I can give is not sacrificing and spending the money. The greatest gift I can give is not uh, a serenade. The greatest gift I can give is not buying the perfect trinket. The greatest gift I can give is freeing people from condemnation, forgiving even as I have been forgiven. And not weighing them down with, oh, I forgive you, my son. Or to your, your spouse, oh, darling, I forgive you for being such a jerk. No, 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 no. All you're doing is creating a problem there. Because they didn't even know they were a jerk, maybe. <laughs> they had no idea. <laughs> and there's no point in bringing it up. Who you know, I, I'm in the who cares ministry. You know, uh, it used to be uh, parents can attest to this. They understand this principle. All teenage children, 98% at least, are innately good lawyers, <laughs> you know, in, in presenting their case of why they are right and you are wrong. <laughs> and it gets old after a while. No offense. <laughs> I get it. It was such a burden for me. My parents were so ignorant. When I was 17, I had the most ignorant parents on earth. God loved them. I don't see how they even got out of the house on their own without my help. <laughs> it was, it, I just needed to lead them. It was, it was such a gift for them to have me in their life. <laughs> but you know, by the time I got to be about 28, 29, 30, I began to think, wow, they're pretty smart. <laughs> As I saw some of the things that I did that didn't turn out so well, and I saw the example of their lives where they'd already gotten some of that figured out, I realized that, hey, maybe, maybe I need to have a different perspective. But I believe that the greatest gift that you can give your friends your family, your neighbors, and the community around you is the very act, the very God-like quality of forgiveness. Letting it go. And as we let it go, Go. That's the word I keep hearing and seeing reverberating in my spirit, man. As you let it go, you can begin to see that other person through the eyes of Jesus. That's the cool part about pastoring. You know, 
I can look at you, and I, and I, I because I've prayed and I've studied and I've prepared, hopefully, and I look at you, I see through eyes of faith, and I think, wow, you are so awesome. You are so beautiful. You are so amazing. And if you would enter in and begin to believe it for yourself, there's no limit to how far God wants to take you and use you and just change the world around you. But I've got to help set you free. I've got to be like Jesus and say, it's okay. I mean, some of you are accustomed to, I'm not, I'm not knocking that, of going to a priest and going through a form and a prescribed way of dealing with sin and, and then being absolved. But you and I are able to enter into the priesthood of the believer and to be Christ-like. I'm not saying I'm, come unto me, all ye, but, but to be Christ-like. I have the ability to say, it's okay. I forgive you. Even if you're not verbally saying it to them, they can sense it and be rid of the spirit of judgment and condemnation. Because I don't care how much you think you got your act together. If you do not forgive, if you do not let it go, you are going to come face to face sooner or later with your own fallible, broken piece of humanity that is fractured and twisted. And you're going to be confronted by the reality of your own weakness unless you can begin to let it go, let it go, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> you got to let it go. In the name of Jesus. This is the end of the teaching from our pastors. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org or download our app in the App Store. Thank you for listening.